All right, welcome to our class this morning. I don't know about you, but man, I'm dragging today. So um, we'll hurry and get through this and then we can go do something other than this today. Um, I wanna go back though. I finally put together um, something that I had been meaning to put together um, finally. And uh, so it's in the urinary system notes. It's not going to be on the test this semester. Ha ha, it will be in the future because now it's in my PowerPoint. But um, this will help you for those of you that are going to continue on. You're going to go into pharmacology. You're absolutely going to need to know how to do this. So um, this is diuretics, the action of the pharmaceutical diuretics that we have. Um, so let's go ahead and whoops, look at my thing. Okay, so there are three places where our pharmaceutical diuretics are going to work. One of those places is right here on the, on the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Um, if you look at this 25%, this, so these percentages, actually, let's go through those really quick. This um, tells you how much of your sodium chloride basically is going to be absorbed at each portion of the, of the nephron. So we know, we've already learned, 65% of, of your filtrate is going to be reabsorbed by the time it leaves the proximal convoluted tubule. Then we go into the loop of Henle, an additional 25% will be reabsorbed. And then in the distal convoluted tubule, remember, unless um, you have aldosterone and ADH present, well, aldosterone actually, then you really don't get a lot of sodium chloride reabsorbed. So we'll get a little bit, 5%, and then the collecting duct, 1% to 2%. Now, depending on how bad your blood pressure how high your blood pressure is, because this is why we're going to give you a diuretic, is because your blood pressure is too high. So we want to lower your blood volume, lower your blood pressure. And so there are three places that we can take a look at this. So the first place is right here at the thick ascending limb. We have this transporter right here. It's called the sodium potassium 2 chloride channel. And, um, and it's not really a transporter, it's a channel, because it's, it's not active transport. Um, and so, um, in this, no, it's not act. Well, I'm, don't, don't quote me on that now that I think about it. Um, but if you notice right here, I have a sodium and potassium and two chloride ions that are going to be reabsorbed. And so, um, our loop diuretics, particularly furosemide, which is, um, LASIK is going to be, um, well, it's not the most common. Thiazides are the most common, um, uh, commonly prescribed diuretic. But um, if you've got the, the Lasix, oh, I didn't mute everybody. Hang on. I've got to mute everybody. Because I don't know who that is. Hey, now you're muted. Um, OK, so um, you can ask Mr. Henson. <laughs> what Lasix does for him every morning. He said, once that pill hits, that he has got to be close to a bathroom because it's like, okay, so here's what's happening. We know that um, uh, if we are blocking this absorption of sodium chloride, it's gonna do two things. It's gonna keep it in the tubule, obviously, and what that's gonna do is raise the osmolarity here so that the water will wanna stay, so that the water will be less likely to leave on the thick ascending, or thick descending, thick des oh, sorry, on the thin descending limb. There is a thick portion, that threw me off for a minute, down here in the thin descending limb where, where it actually leaves once it hits the medullary osmotic gradient. Um, so the water will be less likely to leave and then the second thing, if you're not pumping the sodium and, and well, the sodium chloride out into the medulla, what's that going to do to the gradient? Well, it's going to decrease your gradient. So not only are you not going to have water leaving the tubule here, you're not going to have water wanting to leave the collecting duct over here either. Okay, so if we take out um, the a look at the loop diuretics, so they act on the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter in the thick ascending limb to inhibit sodium potassium and chloride reabsorption, and it's going to inhibit the macula densa. So up here, 
remember this actually flips around and goes right here. So when we get to the top, actually when we get to right here at the uh, distal convoluted tubule, that's actually right there. So the top of the thick ascending limb is the um, macula densa. And so by, by blocking, because remember if the macula densa is, uh, has a lot of sodium and chlorine in it, it's going to slow down um, GFR. But we don't want GFR to be slowed down. We don't want to retain the water. We want to get rid of it. We want to raise GFR. So by blocking the macula densa, that's going to be as if you have low blood pressure. So that's going to stimulate the re release of renin, increase GFR. Um, so we're inhibiting, inhibiting, <laughs> inhibiting tubuloglomerular feedback so that the increase in salts at the macula densa does not decrease GFR. And again, like I said, prevents generation of that hypertonic renal medulla, so the, the medullary osmotic gradient. Um, so not as much water will be drawn out of the tubule and collect, oops, collecting that, thereby increasing urine output. And furosemide or Lasix is the most common of these loop diuretics. Now, the problem with diuretics is that two out of the three diuretic classes that we use, groups that we use, are known as K-wasting or potassium wasting because potassium is lost in the urine due to inhibition of potassium 2-chloride transporter. So if we go back here, oh yeah, I'm potassium wasting here because I'm, I'm, not, I'm not reabsorbing the potassium, I am keeping it in the tubule. So then I'm gonna have hypokalemia, hypokalemia, but then I'm gonna get um, hyperpolarization because they go backwards. So hypokalemia gets, gives you hyper, um, hyperpolarization, <laughs> and then hyperkalemia gives you hypopolarization, and um, in either way, the you're gonna you're gonna get cardiac arrhythmia. We've we've established that if you mess with potassium, you're gonna get cardiac arrhythmia, and um, and so then you're gonna get all of your membrane potentials all screwed up, and so uh, we've got to keep that potassium. We've got to keep that potassium. So that's the risk that we run when, when prescribing loop diuretics and thiazides. So thiazides are also um, potassium wasting, being that they are going to block um, uh, these, well, let's go right here. Okay, so they're going to inhibit um, the sodium chloride transporter. So now we're going to leave um, uh, on the distal convolute tube that pulls um, uh, sodium con blah, 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 blah. Um, Now this, wait. Um, oh, okay. So, um, no, this doesn't look right. I'm going to come back to that. This is, what is wrong with that? There's something wrong in my brain going, that doesn't make sense. So we're going to inhibit the sodium chloride transporter. So we're going to leave potassium. Mm, okay, I got to come, we're, I'll come back to this. I got to fix this. It's still, because um, if you inhibit that, where if we reabsorb, see that just doesn't make sense to me. Something's wrong in my, in my notes. So we'll leave that. Just know that <laughs> thiazides are going to act on the sodium chloride transporter right here. Fortunately, this is not on the test, you guys. And um, potassium and hydrogen ions, you're also, because you're going to get, you're going to lose, because I know this is right, you're going to lose potassium and you're going to lose hydrogen ions. But if you're blocking the transporter, why would you reabsorb more? Because we don't want that. I, this right here is bugging me. Everything down here is right, but up here, anyway. Okay, forget that. And then the last one, oh, because I did that in a hurry yesterday, so I think I messed it up, um, is um, what we're going to do on the collecting duct instead is antagonize the action of aldosterone so that less sodium is reabsorbed. And, um, and so we're also going to end up with fewer potassium and hydrogen ions being lost. And, uh, and so... Um, uh, that one will keep you from losing the potassium. And then um, spironolactone is, is the one that acts there. 
but anyway, okay. So the loop one is the one that I wanted you to know the most about because it's the one that's the most effective. Okay, anyway, so moving on, let's get out of here. Oh, that is gonna bug me to like figure out what I did wrong on that. Let's see, I can't get out of, there we go. Okay. Um, oh, hang on. Oh, save. Okay, uh, let's see. All right, so we're gonna finish off acids and base balance stuff information and then I think Monday we're gonna go back and um, and then uh, really review um, urinary system stuff again um, control of GFR and all of that stuff for for Wednesday and so on okay so Where are we? Okay, so here we are. So we got to the kidneys. We went through respiratory system. So let's just go back over that again. Okay. So um, let's look at this right. Let's go right here. All right. Um, you know what? I'm going to do this instead. Okay. Because I... I need to make sure that we know this super, super good. All right, so I'm gonna put our low formula in here. CO2 plus H2O. Um, whoop, and then um, H2CO3 and then And then hydrogen ions plus, whoops, plus H2. Oh. All right. Okay, so there is our carbonic acid bicarbonate equation. So um, if we go back to the notes, um, and it says in healthy individuals, CO2 is expelled from the lungs at the same rate it's formed in the tissues. During CO2 unloading in the lungs, the reaction shifts to the left and hydrogen ions become water. When hypercapnia occurs, medullary chemoreceptors chemo via CSF acidosis promoted by excessive CO2 increase respiratory rates and depth, hyperventilation. Okay, so, and then a rising plasma hydrogen ion concentration that results from any metabolic process excites the respiratory center, also causing more hyperventilation. So. Let's do, um, okay, so let's do this way. Oops, not that one. Let's do this one. All right, so we know that the, the reaction is going to proceed to the right when we are in. the tissues, okay? And when it we're causing that to happen, then this is going to be um, hypoventilation, right? Okay, so when we're not breathing as much, then we're gonna drive the equation to the right, we're gonna build up our CO2, but then we're, cause we're you know, exercising or we're not breathing very much. So our CO2 levels will rise. And then we need to make sure that this will, uh, let's just put right here, Oops. produces a drop in pH. Okay, so always remember that you, when you are hypoventilating, and when the reaction is going to the right, you always get a drop in pH. Now, here are the two things. Um, this will cause, and let's put this, because this is the two things we run. Causes respiratory uh, acidosis, right? Okay, so it causes respiratory acidosis, but 
it compensates for uh, metabolic alkalosis. Okay, so the respiratory system can be both. It can be a cause and it can be a compensation. So we wanna remember that if, if we're CO2 is building up, if our CO2 levels are high, then we'll have respiratory acidosis or if our pH is high, then that means we're compensating for metabolic alkalosis. Okay, so those are its two functions. Then if we do it the other way, we run it, oops, I don't wanna take it that far. Okay, so then take it to here. Okay, this is gonna happen in our lungs. Okay, we're proceeding to the, to the um, left in our lungs. That's how I remember, left in your lungs. And then that's going to be hyperventilation. Okay. And then it's going to um, cause respiratory alkalosis or it's going to compensate for metabolic acidosis because it, I'll just put it over here, produces a rise in pH. Okay, so does anybody have a problem with that? Or is everybody good with that? Because that's where I want, to, want you to be with respiration. Let's put one more relationship. High CO2 equals low pH. And then over here, low CO2 gives you, oops, gives you high pH. And that's a relationship you always want to remember forever, never, never. Okay, so does anybody have any questions on that? Perfect. Okay, so then I'm going to go to the to our um, renal system notes, and then we'll probably do the same kind of thing um, with the renal mechanisms. So, okay, so um, remember that, and so this we just did. It was in that whole thing. Those two slides were on the whiteboard. All right, so what if our respiratory system was the cause? Then obviously our renal system is going to be the, the um, compensating system. It's gonna fix the problem for us. Um, we have to remember that, it's, that the, um, the uh, renal system takes hours to days to actually fix the problem. Um, so you could be in COPD. So let's say you had COPD, you had the emphysema. You may be in respiratory acidosis for a while before, once you start not being able to breathe, before your kidneys can work to, uh, to fix the problem. Um, okay, so um, in our renal mechanisms, remember, this is super important that you always remember this. Um, especially when you're looking at what are the causes of the different problems. Losing a bicarbonate ion has the same effect as gaining hydrogen ions. Okay, so it doesn't, mean, doesn't really matter to drop our pH. You can either get too many hydrogen ions or you can lose bicarbs. And then conversely, gaining a bicarb, and we already said that in, in our lab one time, um, has the same effect as losing hydrogen ions. So if I'm going to become basic or I'm going to become alkaline, it's either because I have too many bicarbs or I don't have enough hydrogen ions. And so we want to get those relationships in our head. We want to make sure that we understand, oh, okay, I get that. I don't have enough acid here. I'm in alkalosis. How can I not have enough acid? Maybe I don't have enough hydrogen ions. Maybe I have too many bicarbs that are binding to my hydrogen ions and taking them out of solution. Conversely, what is um, uh, making me too acidic, I have too many hydrogen ions, or I don't have enough bicarbs, 
to, to buffer those hydrogen ions, and therefore I have more hydro, free hydrogen ions in solution, dissociated hydrogen ions. Um, okay, and then um, the rate of hydro, oh, so to reabsorb bicarbonate, hydrogen has to be secreted, and when bicarbonate is secreted, hydrogen ions are retained. So this is really what your kidneys are doing when they're fixing the problem, is they're altering your amount, the, the ratio, okay, because that's what it's all about. We're changing the ratio of bicarbonate to hydrogen ions, depending on are we acidic or are we basic, okay. Um, and then rate of hydrogen ion secretion falls with O2 levels, I mean CO2 levels, we know that because we just looked at that. Um, and then, of course, if I have more CO2 in my blood, then I'm going to need to get rid of hydrogen ions faster. As hydrogen ions go into the tubule, binds with bicarbonate in the tubule to make water and CO2. Um, uh, and then, um, so if I need to um, uh, get rid of that, or I can also secrete my hydrogen ions. I guess I didn't put that in the notes. I can see, secrete my hydrogen ions and then the phosphate in my urine will buffer that so I don't have to worry about it really burning when I urinate. And then kidneys can also generate new bicarbonate ions because they have, uh, the kidney tubule cells have um, carbonic anhydrase in them. Okay, whoops. Okay, this thing right here that says know this table is that um, table that I gave you in the packet that has all of the causes of all four imbalances. So it's the one that has them listed. So severe diarrhea, starvation, diabetic or untreated diabetic mellitus, um, excess alcohol consumption. So that page right there that's in the packet, that's this table right here. Maybe I'll, oh, maybe today I'll put in that, put that in my PowerPoint for in the future. Okay. So let's now talk about the four um, acid-base imbalances. Okay, so first one, respiratory acidosis, CO2 retention. I'm gonna beat this horse forever, okay? So I retain CO2, I'm gonna become acidic. And so um, what are we gonna look for to see, are we in respiratory acidosis? Remember, is a pCO2 greater than 45 millimeters mercury? Most common cause of the acid base imbalance, breathing shallowly, pneumonia, cystic fibrosis, emphysema, chronobronchitis, narcotic orbiturate overdose, injury to the brainstem, depression of the respiratory centers, causing you to accumulate CO2, pH drops, CO2 rises. So COPD is really the cause of respiratory acidosis. But remember, this is, so when we're doing at, um, ABGs, this is the number we're looking for. Oops, is it greater than 45? Okay, then we go to the next one. How about respiratory alkalosis? So this is CO2, a loss of CO2, elimination of CO2 that's going to take the hydrogen ions with it. So my pCO2 level, if I'm going to be in respiratory alkalosis, has got to be less than 35 millimeters of mercury. So CO2 is removed from the body faster than it is produced due to hyperventilation. Oh, look at that. Yep. Respiratory alkalosis, always hyperventilation. Now, there usually is not a disease that causes you to hyperventilate. Okay, so no pathology other than maybe secondarily to having asthma or pneumonia because both of those could get you into respiratory alkalosis or high elevation sometimes too because you're just so forcefully breathing that because remember now at high elevations, my arterial blood could have a PO2 of less than 60 and that can also stimulate my, um, my dorsal respiratory group and cause me to breathe deeper and, and faster. Um, brain tumor and injury, sure. Okay, but remember, it's always gonna be hyperventilation. You're always removing CO2 faster than it's produced, removed. Okay. All right. Okay, so then there's that from that same table that you have. 
All right, metabolic acidosis is the second most common cause of acid-base imbalance. And so um, your, your pH and bicarb levels are going to be below homeostatic ranges, okay? So remember, I'm looking, and both of these are low, so that's the elevator effect, so that both um, bicarb and um, pH are, are lower than they're supposed to be. So how does that happen? Uh, too much alcohol, because alcohol is going to be converted to acetic acid by your liver. If I lose bicarbonate, there that is. I'm not getting too many hydrogen ions yet. This is a case where I'm losing bicarbs. So I'm losing it in my diarrhea, um, maybe exercise or shock. Now that I'm producing hydrogen ions, but they're pulling these babies out of solution. So now I have a deficit of these. Um, if I'm in ketosis, okay, because I'm in DKA, let's put that DK, diabetic ketoacidosis or starvation, because really, you know, diabetic ketoacidosis is the same as starvation, because starvation really is a lack of carbohydrates. And that lack of carbohydrates is kicking your body into starvation mode. That's why people who are on the ketogenic diet are on the ketogenic diet is because they want to push their body into starvation mode. They don't really realize, I mean, most people don't realize, oh, is that what I'm doing? I just want to lose weight. Okay, how do you lose weight? You starve, you, you decrease your caloric intake or your caloric supply of carbohydrates for cellular respiration. So anyway any dieting is starvation. And then kidney failure, because I'm failing to do two things. So I can't get rid of the hydrogen ions, but I can't make new bicarbs too. Okay, so both of those are taking place when your kidneys are failing. All right, so all of those are metabolic acidosis. And then metabolic alkalosis is going to be a rising pH and a rising bicarb, okay, but usually, um, uh, well, it depends on what you're doing, okay, because a lot of times with metabolic alkalosis, you're losing, you're losing um, acids, okay, so you're vomiting, so you're losing your stomach acid, but if you have a lot of heartburn and you take too many antacids to counteract the effect of the heartburn, that could give you too many bicarbs, Okay, and then constipation, because now you're reabsorbing too many bicarbs. So think about if you were constipated and you had um, acid reflux, oh, then you'd really be going into metabolic alkalosis. All right. And then here's the same, our chart. Okay. All right, so now why do we want to keep things within a normal range? Um, because... <laughs> If you go below 7.0, then your CNS is depressed, you'll get coma and death, okay? So whatever acidosis, you'll go into depression, CNS, coma, and death. Above 7.8 overexcites the CNS, you'll get tetany, nervousness, convulsions, and death from respiratory arrest because you'll get tetany in the respiratory muscles. So you're gonna die either way. Just do you want to go into a coma before you die or do you want to convulse before you die? Um, neither one. I just want to go to sleep and not wake up until I'm in heaven. All right. So what are we going to do respiratory-wise, which we just looked at? Okay. So when we're in metabolic acidosis, respiration rate and depth are elevated because if we're in acidosis, generally, uh, probably, we have been... Um, uh, producing too much CO2 and so now that CO2 is going to drop the pH and then it's going to stimulate respiration rate and depth. Um, when metabolic, when in metabolic alkalosis there's going to be fewer CO2s generally and um, that lack of CO2 is going to not stimulate the, uh, um, the respiratory centers to and so you're your breathing rate will slow down to match that CO2 that you happen to have. So when metabolic acid alkalosis, sorry, slow, shallow breathing. So hypoventilation, hypoventilation. 
Um, let's say that you're in hypoventilation, so you're in acidosis, your kidneys will retain bicarbs. If you're hyperventilating and you're in alkalosis, then your kidneys will eliminate bicarbs as far as bicarbs are concerned. Or they'll secrete, we could also put secrete hydrogen ions, retain hydrogen ions in this bottom one. All right, um, so this just shows you some numbers if you want to play with more arrows. I believe I gave you, yeah, I think you've got this portion in the, in the packet, but let's just look at this. If it's gonna confuse you, don't look at it. <laughs> just don't listen for a minute, but it's just another way of trying to figure out um, what's going on. So let's start out. We have respiratory acidosis. How do we know we have respiratory acidosis? Because our pH is low, okay, so that's acidic. But remember that if it's respiratory acidosis, then the PCO2 has to be greater than 45, so it's elevated. All right, so now, we know that if the bicarb levels are high, they're gonna be high if they're compensating because I'm in an acidic state, so I need some more bicarbs to make me better. But the bicarbs won't make me acidic, the bicarbs are my compensating value. So if I'm in acidosis, my PCO2 is gonna be high, and then my, my compensating value will also be high in order to fix the problem. And then conversely, if I'm in respiratory alkalosis, then, and this is the seesaw effect, this is seesaw effect as well. So here I am, respiratory alkalosis, pH is high, PCO2 is low because I've blown off all my CO2s. And if I'm in alkalosis, my bicarbs will be too high, so then I need to get rid of them. And so they will be low as well. And then this will all be partial, of course. If, every, if all of the arrows are out of whack, then you automatically know it's partial compensation. All right, if it's metabolic acidosis, pH is low and bicarbs are low. Oh, there's the elevator effect because the arrows are both going down. And then what would you want to do to compensate? If I'm in an acidic state, I want to hyperventilate, which would mean my PCO2 level would decrease. If I'm in metabolic alkalosis, my pH is high, my bicarbs are high, and my PCO2 is gonna be high because I want to make some more hydrogen ions to counteract. I wanna hypoventilate in order to counteract the effect of high pH. So that's what that chart is telling you. And then this just, don't even look at this. I don't even wanna look at that. It's just how do we, what, how are we getting rid of the hydrogen ions? And how are we retaining bicarbs? So that's what this is all about, but we don't even, and here we're making some more. Anyway, don't even look at that. <laughs> it's just too much. And again, some more hydrogen ion secretion. And we don't need to look at that. Oh, and then we're done. Okay, well, that wasn't very much today. All right, so what do you guys wanna do now? Anything, do you wanna just quit or do you wanna do some more, um, some more review of ABGs or whatever, I'm at your disposal. Whoops, I just wanted to see. Eh, we we don't have quite as many today. Nobody wants to do anything this morning. Well, that's fine. <laughs> oh, ABGs. Okay, Livia wants to do ABGs. So we're gonna do ABGs. Um, what do I wanna do? I wanna share, and I'm just gonna have you guys just so tell me how to do this. So I'll get rid of this one. Okay, and then we'll just start all over again. So let me come up with some numbers. Um, There was one semester I did this <laughs> and there was no answer because <laughs> I put the wrong numbers in and they're like, Miss G, we don't even know. We can't even do this problem. Um, so I'm making sure I don't do that right now. Okay. Um,
Okay. There we go. So let's put some arrows in. So what kind of arrow am I going to put with my pH? Anybody? It's within range. Okay, so what do I do with pH when it's in range? If it's below four, it's going to go down, but right. the dotted line down. Yay, whoops. Yes, okay, oops, wrong kind of arrow. Okay, oh no, I can't do that. Um, let me just draw it. Okay. Right, okay, good. All right, now what? PCO2 is? PCO2 is high. I, okay. And? HCO3 is low. Low, good. Okay, so now I need to put some words in here. So first of all, what kind of acid-base imbalance would it just have been? Because you just said that it was in range, so? Acidosis. Yeah, it's on the acidosis side. Okay, so now? Which kind? Respiratory. Yes, it is respiratory. Oops, okay. And then it's gonna be? Partial compensation. Okay, let's do which kind of compensation first? Oh, um, renal. Renal, yes. And then we can put in partial because it is. Okay, and then the cause, oops, for our bonus would be what? Hypoventilation. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, we have to have a pathology. We can't put hypoventilation. COPD. I won't take that. Okay, I will not take hypoventilation because you could be holding your breath. That's not a pathology. Okay, so just holding your breath. You know, maybe if you were a pearl, or if you were a free diver and you had dove for like nine minutes, even then, I don't think your body would exhibit respiratory acidosis. I don't think that's even enough to get you really out of whack. So you got to have a pathology for this, right there. Okay. So on there's going to be test questions where the numbers are set up, and we just give you each part of this. You, like, I will like give what? you these numbers, and okay. it's not partial. You're right. So who just said that? Jaden, why isn't it full? It is full. <laughs> yep, we want to get rid. Sorry about that. It is full. Oops. Hang on. Yay for catching that, friends. That's what I love is when, I don't know, where's my thing? Full, because when I mess up and you guys catch my problem. So yes, it's full. So yeah, Josh, did that answer your question? Sorry, I just kind of talked over you. No, it's okay, I got it. Okay. Um, is the dotted line, is that just to signify that it's like it's on its way down, but it hasn't gotten there yet or what? No, what that dotted line mean? the dot. So that's just my own thing to help you see that you were in acidosis because you are on the acidic end of seven point of seven point three five to seven point four five. Okay, so so on that end of the spectrum, but not out of range. That's what the dotted one. Exactly, means. exactly. I'm on the acidic end of seven point four, on the acidic side of seven point four but I'm still within normal range. So because I'm within normal range, then that makes it full compensation. So if, hold on, if you had been lower, if you had been 7.34? Yes. It would then be it, partial exactly. renal compensation. Exactly. And the other part would be respiratory compensation? No, if I was 7.34 in this, in this uh -huh. exact question and 7.34, I'd still be in respiratory acidosis, but it would be partial renal comp. Right. So what, is, what do you mean by partial and full? Like that system is what's going to get you know it what? all the way back Look to homeostasis? Look at this question again. Hang on. Hang on, Josh. And I'll, you know what? See, I messed up, didn't I? 
How did I mess up on this? See, I just told you because I thought it, I did it. Why is this wrong? This whole question sucks. <laughs> what is wrong with this number right here? Well, if it's low, then it should be acidosis as well. So we would exactly. have metabolic and respiratory acid. Exactly. So what should this number be? Let me get rid of that. Oh, I got rid of everything. That number should have been what if we wanted real renal compensation? It needs to be higher it than needs to be high. 26. Let's just clear this crap and start all over again. Okay, so Josh, what were you saying? Um, <laughs> so if something is in partial renal compensation, yes. What does that mean? Does that mean that there's something else doing another part? No, it's nope. It just means my kidneys have not finished fixing the problem. So they are on their way. Because remember, an ABG is a snapshot of time in time. It's what is happening at that moment in my bloodstream. Right. So, so my kidneys are trying. They're still secreting hydrogen ions. They're still retaining bicarbs. They're still making new bicarbs in order to fix the problem. But I caught it. I took the blood sample at a time when my kidneys had not been able to finish fixing the problem. Does that make sense? Yes. So okay. that would be with it out of range, you have not fixed the problem yet. With, with it in pH, range, yeah, with pH, you have. It perfectly. Yes. Okay. That is exactly right. Yes. Okay. I am let's, caught up then. Let's do this again. <laughs> oh, you guys, it is such a Friday today. I can't even tell you. It's just been a morning for me already. All right. So let's do this again. Within range, but low. Okay, within range, but low. So we're going to put a dotted arrow and low. Okay, so it just was in what? Acidosis. Exactly. So I'm going to type that. Okay, but then we look at this number and it is? High. High. So that is my seesaw effect. So that means I'm in? Respiratory acidosis. Right, good. Okay, then what about this number? That's high. High, okay. So then that means, plus if I'm in respiratory acidosis, I'm in what kind of compensation? Renal compensation. Yep, and so now, because I'm, my pH was the, with, oh, is within normal range, then? It's full. It's full. All right. I feel so much better about that because no, the cause is still COPD. The cause is still COPD. Yeah. <laughs> no, Josh, you weren't crazy. It was me. I'm having a day. All right. Okay. Yeah. I I what? Um, I don't really understand why the first one was bad. Okay, like, by the, why the, the bicarbonate couldn't be low. Okay. I think that's a problem. Okay, because I, if, if this were still 17, so let, I'm just going to put it back right here and let's talk about it. Okay. Now, I could have a patient with this problem but she wouldn't or he wouldn't have been fixed at all because this the pco2 levels are way too high that would put me into acidosis my bicarb levels are way too low that would also put me into acidosis so this number here should have been something like this with both of my situations making me in acidosis. My, my, my pH could never be within normal range because nothing in that picture is fixing the problem. Because if we cross this out, okay, this is low, this is low, how can I be normal when this is low and this is low? Do you know what I'm saying? Gotcha. And then would you say that there's no compensation? Like if it well, were... Okay. So, so this could never happen. <laughs> These numbers, this number right here, 
And this number right here will never ever in your whole entire life produce that pH. So that's why that question was bad. Right. Okay. So in this case, if I stick, if I stuck with the 7.17, I couldn't even say, I guess I could say there was no compensation, but actually to make the answer right, I would say that it's both respiratory and metabolic acidosis and leave it at that because that's what it would have been. Okay. But I would never put in a question like that. And trust me, you guys, ever and see how I jinxed myself as I'm typing out the question. I went, oh, okay, so there was this time when I screwed up and I did. So, but no, I make <laughs> sure I work the problems multiple times before I give it to you to make sure that there are no mistakes. So don't worry, Fran. So if we used these new numbers, if we use 7.17 as pH, uh -huh. we use the 17 milli equivalents of bicarb, mm -hmm. but then we change the PCO2 to normal range. Could we right. work that problem? Yes. Right so now? then if I did that, so let's, um, that'll erase the whole thing. So let's um, scribble out this number. And let's make it um, 40. Let's just stick it right smack dab in the middle. So now what are we in? Metabolic acidosis. We're in metabolic acidosis. And then? Partial respiratory compensation. No, what did, I, what did we make this? Or, we made it normal. Oh, so, wait. so we made this within normal range. So that's one of these babies right here. So then that would be no respiratory, right? Are you with so me on that? What, yeah, what would you be doing to get it back up to normal well, pH? Well, eventually I would hyperventilate. So I would want this number to get super, super low. So I would want this to be like 20 especially with the pH of that. I'm, in a, I'm about dead with a pH like that. So I would be hyperventilating my brains out. What would make you, I know this would be hard to achieve in real life, but what kind of metabolic acidosis would, like what's going on in your body to make your pH drop that much? So let's say that I'm already a diabetic and I'm already in diabetic crisis. And then I get a norovirus. And so now I've got super bad diarrhea. So if I, and I drank a bunch of alcohol. <laughs> so you really, we're not trying to get better. <laughs> yeah, I'm not trying to get better at all. I just compounded effects. And then so all your body would have left to do is just try to breathe so hard that you get rid of. Yes, I'm just trying to get the, rid of yeah. all those hydrogen ions I'm generating. Yep. Okie dokie. Yeah, you would have to be super sick and, and lots of contributing factors <laughs> from that list of metabolic acidosis um, pathologies. What's the normal range for bicarbonate again? 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter. Okay. Yeah, so make sure you have those numbers memorized, guys, because I'm not going to put them on the test. So 7.35, 7.45 for pH, 35 to 45 uh, millimeters of mercury for PCO2, and then 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter for bicarbonate levels. All right. Well, it's 9.49 in some seconds. Does anybody have anything last, now that I messed you all up already this morning? Fortunately, we have a whole weekend and one more day before the test to be together. For, well, actually, two more days because we've got Tuesday in lab, too. So we got lots of time to make sure we, we have this. Are we doing cahoots and stuff? Yes. So we'll cahoot. Um, I said originally, eh, let's just keep it at that because lab will be short on um, Tuesday, so we'll just cahoot after lab. Okay. When will you be posting um, the answers to the exercise? Oh, 
today. I can do that today. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure I did it correct. I totally forgot about that. So, yep. Let me make a note. Um, I will just post them in an announcement. Um, post answers to ABGs. So it'll, uh, I might could get it done within the next hour before I have class at 11. So, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me about that. No problem. It's my all right. freaking out OCD. That's all. Nah, no worries. No worries. <laughs> it's all good. Um, and that way by posting it today, then you'll have the weekend to have come ask me any questions that you might have on Monday and Tuesday. Okay. All right. Okay. Have a great weekend, friends. We'll see you on Monday. Bye. Adios, amigos. Bye.